All right, good day. Welcome to today's presentation, Digital Controller Tuning Part A, ILM 310-305-DA. Short and sweet, this one, about 24 slides. Uh, and this one, it kind of gets us, uh, get, gets our toes wet here in digital controller tuning. Uh, not terribly deep uh, in this first ILM. The next one's a little bit worse, so keep that in mind. But uh, let's have a look at what we're after today. Our objectives today, just one of them, uh, describe the features and functionality of digital controllers compared to pneumatic controllers. Uh, this is a little bit out there. Uh, I know there's probably a good number of you that still see some pneumatic controllers. Uh, they're getting more and more rare as time goes by. So I don't imagine it's gonna be too long that they made me take this section out of there because there's, there's just not too many pneumatic controllers out there anymore. Uh, you'll see some significant differences between pneumatic and digital. Uh, basically, it comes down to the fact that pneumatic controllers are uh, built and built to design. Uh, if you've got a PI controller that's pneumatic, it's got to be built as a PI controller. It's not like a digital one where you can uh, add and remove the different uh, algorithms at will. Uh, that's kind of largely the big difference. Uh, but we'll see some uh, comparisons as we go through the ILM here on uh, what the difference is between uh, digital and pneumatic. Of course, digital is much better. Okay, some terminology to get out of the way initially here. Uh, feedback control. Uh, control in which the process variable is fed back and compared to the set point to determine error in order to apply corrective measures. This is the entire baseline of uh, automatic control, um, and it's what we it's what we strive for all the time. It's the basic model. Uh, SAC, same thing as SLDC, uh, it just means a standalone controller. So like the uh, little Yoka Gala thing that we used in the uh, in the lab. It can be, it could be technically analog or pneumatic as well, um, but it would cover that term would cover both of them. Uh, pneumatic controller, uh, purely analog, obviously, and operates by mechanical design. And the applications, as I said earlier, are, are limited by design. Uh, there's not many of them that you can flip on and off the PID values uh, or the variables themselves. Uh, they have to be designed to have them or not have them. A digital controller, uh, maybe an electronic device uh, like the Yokogawa, for example, or part of a software program. So something inside your uh, PLC uh, or your DCS uh, software package uh, will give you controller blocks that do the exact same things as a standalone controller, but of course for many, many different loops. Uh, and then of course we have uh, PID, which we'll talk about uh, quite a bit in this uh, presentation. So your proportional integral and your derivative, and we'll uh, get a good handle on uh, what they do and what they react to. And that's probably one of the major takeaways you're going to want to get out of this uh, ILM is being able to understand uh, all this terminology and, and how these uh, algorithms uh, affect our, our control scheme. Okay, so looking at these algorithms a little bit more detail here, proportional gain uh, or proportional band, depending on uh, what type of machine you're running here, this reacts to the amount of error. Um, you'll see that these are often called actions, so proportional action or integral action or derivative action. They are the same idea here. Uh, integral time uh, reacts to the duration of error, so it reacts to an accumulated uh, error over a period of time and applies a factor uh, based on that. Derivative time reacts to how fast the error is changing. So it has to do with uh, rate, right? So proportional is the same as gain, uh, integral or res uh, reset and derivative or rate. You've heard them probably interchanged that way. Pneumatic controllers use an interacting algorithm and we'll talk about what the heck this means in a second. Um, but what it means in general terms before we really look at it specifically is that the P, I, and D interact with each other. Um, and that's something to uh, pay attention to as we move forward here because uh, although we may use some or all of these different algorithms together, the way that they affect each other uh, and the final controller output uh, varies by design. 
Uh, and this is what we're going to be talking about when we're defining it as an interacting algorithm. Uh, it means that uh, an error will come in uh, into the controller. Some uh, algorithm dealing with proportional will be applied to it. It will create a new signal, which will be forwarded to the integral portion, which will do some math on that number, create another new signal, send it to the derivative component. It will do some math, and then it will send out a final number uh, as the controller output. And there are many variations on that. Well, not many, but three for sure that we're going to look at today. Uh, digital controllers, as I said, uh, as I just said here, we'll have three. Uh, they are interactive, standard, and parallel. So these are the three standard uh, controller algorithms and the way they, they deal with the proportional integral and derivative uh, functions. So looking at this one here, the first one here is interactive. It's also known as series. Um, and the, the descriptions I keep on the slides here are relatively simple. Uh, the diagrams do represent uh, the wording fairly well, and it's pretty easy to understand. But you can see here, uh, we get a signal comes in uh, compared to our set, uh, set point and PV get compared. We get an error. That error value comes out. The proportional block does some math on it. You see P affects the D. So it'll do some math on it. It'll come up with a new number. That number will go into D. It'll get some math done on it. Then that new number will come out. It will get plugged into the summing block. Um, it'll come out of that summing block into the integral portion where we'll apply some integral math to it. And then it'll be added back into the summing block where it'll be compared to the PD component we have here. And then in controller output signal uh, will be generated. So like the diagram shows here, P affects D and PD comes out of here and affects I. So that's what's going on in this little block diagram. Uh, in controllers like this one, changing one setting affects all of them. Uh, if we don't want some feature, we set it to zero, just like we did in the lab. We turned off our integral and derivative by setting their values down to zero. So this is interacting. Uh, pay, pay attention kind of to the block diagrams. There's a block diagram for each one of the three that we're going to look at. So the second one here uh, is the standard type of algorithm. They call this the non-interactive, also known as the ISA algorithm. Uh, this is uh, one of the more common ones. Uh, if we look at it, this one, uh, look at the signal here, we get our set point compared to our process variable generating an error. Number comes out, goes to the proportional block, it gets some uh, math done to it, and it sends out a new signal. That signal goes here, here, and here at the same time. So you'll see that P affects I, P affects D, but D never gets to I, and I never gets to D and vice versa. Um, most tuning out algorithms are, are, uh, are this style, most commonly. Um, the next one here, or the last one, is called a parallel algorithm. And you can see if we can compare a little bit here. It's, I don't know if you can call that evolutionary or not, but this one is purely par parallel, as well as if you looked at this one, you would say that this is definitely series. Uh, operated there. Uh, this one is definitely parallel. So here you'll see that the error signal gets uh, sent independently to the derivative proportional and the integral blocks, which each do their own functions, send a signal. That signal comes to a summer where it, it generates a final controller output signal. Uh, this is a plant gain, of course, if we uh, go back a few ILMs. So in this uh, algorithm, there is no interaction between the modes. So those are the three algorithms that you have to be aware of. Again, this one uh, is the most common, but being able to understand what's going on in the image, identify the image according to the name and or the description of uh, what exactly happens is uh, the requirement that we're after here. <clears throat> okay, tuning units. Uh, we've probably already handled this. Uh, you've played around in the lab and we've already uh, kind of addressed these things here, but just for review, uh, the P, um, usually means proportional gain. Uh, some use proportional band. Uh, if you have to convert, and we did this in the lab, uh, to get the gain, you do 100 over proportional band and vice versa if you want to go the other way. I, uh, for integral, is in either minutes or seconds. There were seconds in the lab uh, and is expressed as time or minutes per repeat or repeats per minute or seconds it could be. Some manufacturers, as I just said, will use TI in minutes per repeat, 
uh, some of them will use KI, which is repeats per minute. To go back and forth, you just do one over the other. So if I'm three minutes per repeat and I want to find out how many repeats per minute, I just do one over three and you'll see it's 0.33 repeats per minute. The math is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, lastly, derivative here uh, uses the symbol KD. Uh, does it really? Not really. Um, and is expressed as gain in minutes or seconds, again, depending on your uh, machine. So PID, I think we have a pretty good understanding of what those are. All right, so here's a little bit of comparison to pneumatic, which is, uh, I guess, the purpose of this ILM here, although it's not mentioned that much. Uh, so digital implementation here on page five. So we mentioned earlier that a pneumatic controller performs the integral and derivative functions simultaneously in what is called the interactive algorithm model. Uh, that signal is split. Digital controllers don't do this, and this is important when you're we're talking about the amount of time it takes to process. Uh, it'll perform one function, such as proportional, then it'll scan again, then it'll do the integral calculation, then it'll scan again, then it'll do the derivative calculation, then it'll scan again. Uh, so rather than doing it all at once like a pneumatic controller would do, the, the digital one, uh, it does each function in a scan cycle. These scan cycles, again, are very, very, very fast, um, but cumulatively, uh, it can add up uh, to some lag time. So that's something that you have to uh, distinguish between uh, pneumatic controllers and digital controllers. The pneumatic ones generally are, are potentially faster. Uh, to, fix, uh, to fix this, we uh, dampen or filter the PB signal. So you can imagine that if I'm doing, uh, I get a, an error signal from a digital controller, it comes in, I do my proportional uh, math on it, and then I do another scan, if my PV has changed in that quarter of a second or whatever it is, the next set of math I'm going to do on the integral block is not going to be on the same base number. So it's going to be problematic uh, moving forward, even when we get to derivative, if they're all based off different root numbers of, of error. So there's a way to fix it. Uh, and this is by dampening or filtering the PV signal so that it doesn't change before all these individual scans have occurred. The ILM recommends uh, the setting is 0.5 times the controller scan rate, meaning that you're uh, you're looking at it quicker uh, quicker than it can scan, so that that number uh, doesn't change. Uh, we can do this filtering or dampening either in a transmitter or in the controller, and again, depends on what type of a, a system uh, that you're running. Um, but generally, this is done in the in the DCS or PLC. Okay, another unique uh, thing that we have to consider uh, when we're dealing with different controllers, uh, specifically uh, pneumatic ones, well, I guess it works pneumatically and digitally. Uh, and this is something that we call bumpless, bumpless transfer. Uh, bumpless transfer is something that we want to do, and set point tracking is something that allows us to do it. So bumpless transfer, by definition, has to deal with having bumpless transfer. Let's look at the definition here. So the switch manual to automatic or automatic to manual, automatic to manual without any change in the output control signal. So uh, you got to think yourself, you're running a process. Um, maybe you're starting it up or something like that. The whole plant is in manual. Uh, you're, you've I uh, use the controller uh, output settings to open a valve a certain a certain percentage uh, and he kind of got the plant all running up on manual uh, and everything's fantastic. If you uh, didn't have set point tracking and you switched from manual into automatic, the controller is going to go where it wants to go. Uh, it could be zero. It could be 100%. You're you're not sure. All that setup you just did to start up your plant is going to get thrown out the window. So the way that this is overcome is with something called set point tra tracking. And basically, what set point tracking uh, does is it it monitors either the set point that's input into the system or the output of the controller, so that when you're in auto or manual, either one, the other mode also is receiving the current signal so that when you switch to it, it's already at that signal. 
So it's like you're uh, you're at work with uh, somebody, maybe you're working a split shift, day shift, night shift, uh, and you're doing some work on a particular project, and then the night shift guy uh, comes in and ideally is going to carry on exactly where you left off. Um, that would be uh, kind of like set point tracking. He would, he would come in, you would tell him, okay, I've done all of this, this is where we're at, and then you go home and he carries on from there. Whereas uh, the option without this, I guess, let's call it set point tracking, uh, you do your work throughout the day, your shift ends at five, his shift starts at six, you go home at five, don't tell him anything, he comes in, he's got to spend a bunch of time trying to figure out where the heck you were to start out with, uh, meaning that the output or the production is going to go way down and you're going to have this bump in production, basically. So that's the best I can do in terms of an analogy that might make a little bit more sense on a, on a uh, layman's terms, I guess. So let's see if I got this word in here. We don't want the controller output to jump because it may upset the process. This is the whole purpose of it. Think of changing drivers. Oh, this is, I, I did have one in here already. Think of changing drivers while driving down the highway, right? You don't want to, you can be, you can do it, but you don't want to be swerving all over the road. You don't want to be speeding up and you don't want to be slowing down and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you want to make sure that you're on the, on the same page and you're as smooth as possible when you're switching. Pneumatically, uh, this is done through operational procedure. Uh, and those of you who have done some work with pneumatic controllers will know that there's usually some uh, levers and valves. Uh, some of them have like little balance uh, beads inside of them where, you know, you turn a couple of knobs and you get that little bead to come into the window. And when the bead's in the window, you know that your uh, automatic setting is the same as your controller output. So when you flip the knob, you're not going to get a big rush of air going out to a valve and opening the valve or uh, losing your air and closing the valve. So that kind of thing. Basically, you're balancing what's currently happening in the operating process with what you want it to be when you switch it into manual or automatic. So uh, pneumatically, it's done through operational procedures, some kind of you know hand working that you got to do. In a digital controller, it is programmable. Uh, and the programming uh, that we do to make sure that we get bumpless transfer uh, has to do with what we are tracking and we call set point tracking. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing that has to happen for bump bumpless transfer is that the set point tracks the process variable in manual. So when it's in manual, it is looking at the process variable and it's saying, let's say you're open your valve 50% and your flow is at 50%, the controller is going to be looking at it at you're saying, okay, this PV is at 50%, so I'm going to make my set point uh, comparable in value to the PV so that when I switch it from manual to automatic, those numbers are the exact same. There's no bump. Okay, the second thing uh, that can happen is that we have our proportional integral and derivative output tracking the controller output when it's in manual. So I guess that's a better example of the first one, but same idea. Uh, what the controller is putting out when it's in manual is being watched by the PID component. And that value is being fed into the front end of the PID component so that when you switch, again, this output and this output are the same. Lastly, the third possibility is that the manual output tracks the controller output when it's in auto. So again, you're in automatic. Uh, the controller does whatever it does. It changes the controller output. The manual output will follow the controller output so that when you switch from manual to auto, you don't get that bump. That was probably a lot more time describing than I needed to. Okay, so uh, this is not necessarily in the ILM, but I included it. It was part of my last presentation. It has to do with auto manual switch because that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about bumpless transfer uh, is that uh, phenomenon that could potentially happen as we switch between modes. If one of them is at zero and one of them is at 100, for example, it's going to be a big problem. So normally for something to be automated, it has to be in auto. That means that the uh, computer is doing all the math and control, and we call that closed loop, basically. Sometimes, however, we may need to override that system. This we call manual control or open loop, and this is generally the way startups happen. You usually start up in manual, and then you turn the knob over to automatic, and then the plant uh, just runs. 
when we uh, or we can do certain oops whoa, 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 whoa. we can do certain things in each mode so we, we've already gone over this this is just kind of review we know that when we're in auto the operator can only adjust the set point and the controller will take care of everything else and when we're in manual the operator can only adjust the controller output and the controller output will do whatever it's set to um, and we experience that in the lab so when we look at that in a block diagram here's what's going on uh, you'll see that we have our uh, error generated by the comparison between the pv and the set point um, we have our proportional integral and derivative they're coming into our algorithms we take our error we apply these functions and it makes the controller output signal a that controller output signal a because this switch is in auto is going out to our valve okay so let's say that we're we did a bunch of math and we're sending out a signal of 50 percent it's going out to our valve 50 percent this signal is also as you can see tied back to the manual output of the controller so this 50 percent is also split and sitting right here so now when i flip this switch from auto up to controller output this is sitting at 50 this was sitting at 50 this stays at 50 no problem okay um, that's exactly what just happened uh, on one diagram so that's the whole idea of bumpless transfer anyway uh, same thing similarly this is going backwards here but i'm in manual uh, i got my manual output set at 50 percent i'm sending it to the valve i'm also sending it into this uh, pid algorithm block here so that when i flip it to auto this will also be at 50 percent and we'll have no bump long wordy explanation uh, i think that diagram probably does it a lot faster all right let's look at set point changes and we've talked about this in the lab a little bit um, and we've probably seen this in the lab so there's a couple of slides here that talk about um, set point changes so i mentioned earlier that set point changes are rather quick changes uh, relative to process variable changes and as a result the response or the, to the error that they generate is usually more dramatic especially when we're uh, looking at something um, where we have uh, a high gain which will provide a, a large boost and if it's changing fast uh, we know that derivative responds to the rate of change so if it's a set point change that rate obviously is fast so derivatives is going to act on that as well um, so this is what we're going to be looking at just uh, in the next couple of slides uh, some of those characteristics that we have to worry about uh, in terms of changing error signals so an error is the difference of these, uh, of course between the set point and the process variable when we make a set point change we are producing an error and we are doing it very very fast because derivative works on the speed of change this is an issue this causes uh, something called a proportional and or derivative kick in the output, and this can be bad. So this is the proportional plus derivative kick drawing. Uh, there will be a certain component of it that is related to the proportional variable, and there's gonna be another compounded uh, issue related to the derivative variable that's reacting on the verticality, is that a word, of this line. Uh, and of course, this is, this is bad. This is a huge, uh, a huge change. It's going to cause some upsets for many things downstream, and we don't want this. So to avoid this, uh, we use something called set point softening or filtering. And and again, uh, specifically talking about set point changes because they are much faster than the average uh, process variable changes. Okay, so here's some set point softening or filtering, filtering diagrams and images of what it looks like. Uh, and it's exactly uh, exactly like you would think it would be for, uh, for a filtering example here. So normally uh, we make an entered set point change here. If we didn't have uh, filtering, we'd end up with a proportional kick about that size, plus a derivative kick added onto it as we saw in the previous diagram. Um, but with a filtered response, I can say I only want it to change, uh, you know, X percent per minute or whatever it is. Uh, and it, it uh, electronically modifies the signal to get rid of that kick and give us a nice 
uh, first order looking change here. Uh, same idea, you can enter ramping values saying I only want it to change 2% per minute or something like that. Uh, and it'll it'll do that for us. So these are two things that we can do to avoid uh, proportional and or derivative kick. And that's filtering, uh, ramping, terms softening also come into play there. Okay, there's also other ways uh, besides these electronic settings basically that we can do uh, to modify the signal so it doesn't act all crazy on us. Um, most controllers, will react to error. Uh, that's what we've been taught theoretically. We, we've understood that with the, with the process variable and the set point don't match, we have an error and we're gonna apply PID to it and hopefully get it back under control. But it is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, digital controllers allow us to select the desired signal to use. So we don't have to necessarily use uh, the error signal that's directly compared to the set point and the PV, we have options like this. So for example, we can have PID on the error signal. And this is the one that we most commonly think about. We think, okay, we got an error. I'm applying all of these to that error. And that's fine, except uh, if that error is a set point, we're gonna be we're gonna be applying P to the set point, we're gonna be applying I to the set point and D to the set point, and that can be problematic. So the second one kind of addresses that. It says that we're gonna apply P and I on the error, which means that I'll get a little bit of the proportional kick, but I'm gonna apply derivative on the process variable. So again, the process variable is changing very, very slowly. So this gets rid of the derivative kick part of it by uh, by acting only on the error created by the PV. And remember, the PV is going to change very slowly compared to the set point change that we just made. Then the last option uh, is integral on error and proportional and derivative on the process variable. And this is the most stable uh, of all of them um, because these are reacting to something that is changing relatively slowly. So I believe there's a tile, I think I have slides that show you images of each of these. So here's PID on error. This is what most pneumatic controllers respond like. Again, remember most pneumatic controllers uh, are set in a particular way and that's just the way it is. So here's our set point change. Here's that proportional derivative kick. And we also, we don't want that. Uh, we also notice that there is some overshoot. Um, maybe bad, may not be bad. Uh, it depends on your on your process. What we do know is bad though is is this, and we don't really want that. So let's see what happens when we switch to the next mode, PI on the error and the D on the PV. Okay, so now you'll see, like I said, this removes the derivative action on the set point change, therefore removing that derivative kick. We still have some proportional kick, but it might be acceptable, right? So now the derivative kick component is gone. We still have the proportional kick. You'll see we have a little bit of overshoot on here. Overall, this is really not too bad looking uh, from, a, from a graphical picture. And if you're fine with quarter amplitude decay, this is probably great. But in comparison to the next one where we have integral on the error and proportional and derivative on the process variable, Looky look, we don't have any proportional kick here. We don't have any derivative kick here. We don't have any overshoot whatsoever. Uh, this is really uh, a nice graph. The only thing that you could say probably about this graph is depending on your situation, this might be too slow, this first order plus dead time type response, right? The other ones we've, we've probably got uh, closer to steady state, you know, a little bit sooner here with some deviation. Um, but again, this is all depending on the process and what your plant can handle. <clears throat> so there is the representations. Uh, derivative. So we'll spend a couple of seconds here talking specifically about derivative because again, derivative responds to the rate of change. Uh, when we have control signals, process variables, for example, um, they can they can oscillate, they can be noisy. And the ILM 
uh, or industry or modern control theory, I guess, it tells us that processes like flow, for example, uh, the operation of a final control element, you know, the valve can cycle a little bit. And uh, when a valve is cycling, that is a result of uh, an unstable control signal. Uh, and this is kind of what we're looking at here. Um, we have our controller output on a, let's, let's call this a valve because it's easiest to understand. And it's trying to maintain a set point, but as it's doing that, you know, that valve is opening and closing and opening and closing and opening and closing. And it's, you know, a relatively, it's a relatively good line at 30%, but it's going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Well, every time it makes a direction change, derivative comes into play because it acts on rate of change. Um, and that causes problems, right? Our process variable does this, our controller will also uh, do this. So that can be, you know, problematic. That causes the valve to cycle a lot. So the thing uh, that we can do uh, to deal with the, the effect of the derivative gain here is to have a derivative filter. Okay, uh, so the filter is used to help smooth out the noise, avoiding unnecessary controller actions. The derivative filter is a multiplier that reduces the effect of derivative basically is what it does. The derivative gain is a similar function as you read through the ILM. Uh, you'll see that there's a distinction between the two of them, but they both do the same thing. The derivative gain is a divisor uh, that does the same thing. And it basically just tames down uh, what we call a noisy, uh, a noisy signal. So we hopefully end up um, with something that's a little bit cleaner. Uh, with pneumatic controllers, however, again, because the purpose of this ILM is to compare pneumatic to digital, uh, with pneumatic controllers, this is done with the addition of a bellows slash spring combination. So again, uh, adding features to a pneumatic controller, it's a mechanical thing. Uh, in the digital uh, controller, it's programmed in. All righty, integral action. Uh, what do we know about integral action? We know that integral action is used to remove offset. When used with the PI or PID controller, it makes them prone to something called reset windup, another very important term. Uh, you probably heard last year, but it's a big term in third year, and it's also a big term in fourth year. Uh, so kind of important that you understand what reset windup is. And the fancy science definition of reset windup is the saturation of the bias value of a controller when the PV doesn't match the set point for a period of time. Very fancy sounding. Basically what they're saying here is that it is an accumulation of the integral function or an accumulation of error or over a period of time. And I'll show you a picture here shortly that will give you a much better idea uh, what this really does. Um, but Reset windup causes some problems, serious problems, to be honest with you. Uh, during startup, um, especially when the PV is low and you make a large set point increase. So what's happening here is you're essentially making a very, very large error. And that's problematic. And you'll find out why, um, because the, the math is being done on the uh, amount of error that there is and how long it uh, stays around. And if this uh, the difference between our PV and our set point is large, it, it complicates things, it makes it worse. Okay, uh, another application or another time you're going to deal with this is during an upset uh, that keeps the PV and set point apart for a long period of time. Uh, and you'll see what happens uh, with that, I think, in individual slides here. Okay, and the third scenario we have to worry about is controllers that may not be selected for use for some time. Uh, an example would be selective control, which we haven't covered. Um, but this is uh, an example for, uh, say, selective control basically has two measuring devices. Uh, usually it's in place for, uh, let's call it a redundant application, where one transmitter is working uh, normally, but if it fails, the selective control scheme will automatically switch to the other transmitter. Um, if they're on the same page when that switch happens, no problem. But if they're not, we get a problem. Uh, a bump, right? Um, so we talk about how how we can fix that. So let's just look at, at uh, what this means when we have these uh, essentially large errors caused by three different possible uh, scenarios here. 
Okay, so here's an explanation straight out of the ILM here so that you can understand sort of uh, what's happening using uh, our basic steam exchanger um, process that we've used where we're heating up some kind of product uh, with some steam. Um, let's look at what this graph what this graph means. So here we all we're all happy. Uh, our set point is at 30 percent. Uh, our process variable is at 30 percent. Our controller output is at uh, 50 percent. That's what it needs to be to keep our temperature where we want it to be. And then suddenly uh, step number one we lose our steam supply. Okay something happened something happened over here somebody closed a valve or somebody put another uh, another unit online and then we lost our steam value. So we lose our steam, our temperature, uh, which is our process variable is going to start to go down. As our temperature starts going down, our PV gets away from our set point, which increases our error. Thus, it increases our controller output. The controller is responding by increasing its output by the error amount every TI or integrating uh, integrating time period. In this case, it's 30% every minute. Uh, remember that heating is a, is a pretty slow process. So it doesn't take long uh, for the controller output at 30% uh, a minute here. It doesn't take long for the controller output to reach 100%. We've lost our temperature. Uh, our temperature is still going down. We can't see it, but it's still going down. Uh, our controller wants to open up more, but it can't obviously because that's out of, it's at a hundred percent. But the the computer thinks that it has to keep opening in order to try to catch up to this. So this value and this value are getting farther and farther apart. Finally, what happens here? Uh, let's see. It doesn't take long for the controller output to hit the ceiling. Uh, this is what we call reset wind up. Okay, at this point, this isn't bad. Uh, right here at this point, but everything after this point is called reset windup because this is accumulated error. Okay, now what happens? Um, we get steam back. Whatever happened over here is is fixed. The steam valve now is fully, absolutely fully open. Okay, uh, and it was going to stay that way until the PV gets over. The set point until it unwinds it so it's going to stay open until our pv crosses our set point line okay so now this valve is way 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 open it's way more open than 100 percent open it's way more open so now that it crosses this pv line it's going to say oh i made my pv i can start to close now so at this point here it starts to close well, that's all fine and well, but it's closing, 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 closing. As it's closing, our temperature is going up, 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 up. And then finally, it gets to the point where this output closes enough that it turns around and starts to come down again. So that valve starts to close, but we're still heating a lot. We probably overshot the set point by now, as we see here. And this cycle will continue until it finally settles out. So um that's a lot to wrap your brain around i i get it um but that's really the effect of of integrating and you gotta think of integrating just like you think of integrating in any other way you know you're going to integrate this into the program or you're going to integrate that into the program well you're integrating all all of this existing error and it's not like you just you just close the door here and open the door here and you're off again this is like you're 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 keeping your the truck is filling and 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 to get back to where you were it's not just a matter of unloading the back of your pickup truck uh to the top of the bed rails here you've got a giant heap of mess to take care of before you even get down to uh the basic unloading so that's that's the big problem with uh, integral action and this phenomenon called reset windup. So how do we deal with that reset windup? We can do a few things uh, to keep it from happening, uh, particularly in a digital controller. Uh, in a pneumatic one, of course, again, it has to be equipped with some special components. So there's not a bunch we can do unless it's set up that way. But digitally, uh, we can do a couple of things. First, we can put limits on the controller output. 
Uh, for example, we can make the lower range value 0%, uh, and we can make the upper range value 80%. So that means that the valve will only open uh, to 80%. Thus, we will have less to unwind uh, later, and it will recover faster. The other way that we can eliminate this reset windup is to program uh, our controller so the integral value is way higher when reset windup does occur. Uh, the ILM, I think, says to set it 8 to 32 times higher than you normally would. Uh, and the reason that you do this is by having that serious multiplication there, it helps you unwind much faster. So the windup still happens, but it un unwinds much, much faster. Kind of heavy theoretical stuff, but uh, it's very good. Um, process knowledge to know. Uh, okay, uh, here we have a standard controller with feedback and limits. So if you notice a difference here, let's see, notice a difference. I don't notice a difference at all. Uh, we have something called reset tieback somewhere, do we? Here, yeah. So this controller output sent back into our integral block, our reset block, and then it's reapplied into here. Uh, using this reset tieback or reset feedback here uh, only allows that output to go to preset limits. So having a limit block in here means that we can't have our controller going uh, above 80% or 90% or 100%, whatever we want. We're not going to get it up into that dangerous 150% area. So reset tieback, reset feedback, these are their, uh, this is the mechanism that we use to deal with that reset windup. That, although it wasn't a whole bunch of different material today, was a little bit heavy on the brain, um, but some pretty good general process theory in this lecture. And that is the end of today's lecture. It happens to be a Friday, so everybody have a good weekend.